Today we're going to be talking all things aero and going faster with Dan Bigham. Now, many of you will be familiar with Dan, but for those of you who aren't, here's a quick summary. He's a previous holder of the Men's World Hour record before Filippo Ganna, who he then helped to break his own record. He's a multiple national champion and is one of the current Team Pursuit world champions on the track. Now, prior to riding, he worked as an engineer, including in Formula One, and he used this expertise and applied it into cycling, so much so that he was able to beat riders who on paper are arguably physiologically stronger than he is. He now uses this expertise as a performance engineer for Team Ineos, helping their riders go even faster. So we caught up with Dan for a chat at his home in Andorra. Good to see you, Dan. Thanks for thanks for coming on the call. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, mate. Yourself? Yeah, I'm all right. Well, just just had a race with uh, with Garen the other day. That went that went well. Um, but yeah, we'll so, um, now, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, he said he's going to have a word with Dave B. So you know, we'll see what happens. Um, but big question for most riders: what should they prioritize in terms of aero? if they want to get faster. To break it back down into the different athletes, say you're a climber, then you're probably going to be racing up some some steep climbs. So you might want to be picking fabrics that are a bit lighter, help more with the cooling side of things because you can make trade-offs because you're not, the aerodynamics are, are less important. Whereas if you're, you're out in a breakaway, then making sure that you pick the right fabrics for your body, for your position, um, especially things like aero socks, they're going to be incredibly important. They're a huge winner. Probably the best pound per watt Aero upgrade there is in the world by by some margin. Um, what does a pair of aero socks cost nowadays? 20 quid, 30 quid? They'll permeate their way through cycle sport pretty quickly. Um, they've definitely got a stranglehold on road racing now. You see very few people winning road races in cotton socks anymore. Why is the sock so important? So primarily because your leg is seeing relatively clean airflow and your leg is a pretty terrible aerodynamic shape in a cylinder. So you can have big impacts on the weight behind it, the low pressure weight, by playing around with what's called the boundary layer. So trying different fabrics on the lower leg can have a big, big impact on basically turbulating, turbulating the boundary layer, keeping the flow attached, reducing your pressure drag, and therefore reducing the net drag on the rider. But something I'm a big fan of is the onesie, you know, the one piece jersey and shorts. Now. What is the, the sort of difference that you've observed between that and, and, a, and a normal jersey and shorts? Not a huge amount, to be completely honest. I think a lot of it comes down to, to comfort. I put much prefer a one-piece skin suit than, than two-piece. There's less fabric, less material. But actually, in drag terms, it's relatively minimal because you end up with the, the same fabrics in all the same kind of locations, just the fit is slightly different. So you can achieve a better fitting suit with a one-piece than you can with a two-piece. So if things don't move around quite so much, you can place another pockets in the right kind of place. You can place your actual pockets in the right location. But that's more of a one percenter, actually. So the difference from a bibs and jersey to the equivalent skin suit with all the same fabrics and patterns is actually quite small. Whereas selecting the right fabrics, the right patterns, the right suit that fits you at the right speed is, is significantly greater. Which is a harder thing to achieve. I, I can't sit here and tell say to everybody you need to be track testing or wind tunnel testing, um, but it, it is something that if you really take the sport seriously, you need to, to start looking towards. I think um, that's one thing. Like with the, with pro riders, they get a lot of their kit sort of tailor made. I think, and you know, it's like the jerseys and stuff, and for optimum fit. And I think it's much harder for an amateur rider, in my experience, to get a jersey and shorts to fit as well as the one piece that tends to then just naturally be smoother across, say, the tummy area. That's something that does occur to me. It is something that a lot of clothing manufacturers are becoming aware of, I would say, and trying to provide solutions that, that meet that. It's not an easy thing to do, though, in the world of, of clothing, because you can't stock infinite number of size possibilities, and it's quite hard to make one off of a single garment item. But people are trying, and there's a niche in the market for it, I think. Um, Another piece of clothing that I was interested to hear you on is gl is gloves. What's the penalty or benefit of gloves aerodynamically? In road position, uh, gloves that normal like sort of track knits, sort of um, short fingers, relatively minimal, like small differences other than going to big, big gloves. Then, especially when you're out on the drops and on the hoods, not very tucked in, then they can be pretty, pretty poor aerodynamically. So again, it, it's coming down to picking 
the choice around the weather. Don't don't kind of cover all and put your winter gloves on when it's just say 10 degrees because you might be costing yourself a huge amount of performance so it's it's a bit of a trade-off there obviously you've got to be able to ride your bike brake change gears if you can't do that you're probably not going to win the bike race but at the same time you could be costing yourself quite a bit of drag reason why one of the reasons why i ask you i've seen a lot of like track riders in say the olympics whatever or time trialists in in high profile time trials not wearing sort of any gloves um mm-hmm. as, if, as if that might be faster than wearing gloves at all yeah typically is the case for most people gloves are slower on in tt positions this is so it's, it's not always the case obviously everyone's individual and it's worth testing but as a blanket rule probably not faster with gloves yeah interesting mm. so another thing that i wanted to ask you is around water bottles because there seems to be a lot of kind of myths around water bottles and a lot of people have heard different things and i think these have emanated from various different sources over the years but you get people going oh water bottle on the seat tube is quicker than a water bottle on the down tube a water like one water bottle is quicker than no water bottles and then some people go no water bottles is the fastest and all this and you get all this like everyone seems to think that they're right but What's and the reason tip? they're right is because it depends. <laughs> the biggest, <laughs> biggest caveat in the world. And I've I've seen data every which way. In fact, we did some testing a good few years ago on the Velodrome that showed that yeah. different bikes had different results depending on whether you had a round bottle, an aero bottle, was it was the frame designed around it, was it not? And I think most modern bikes nowadays are concerned the fact that most people probably want to have a drink on their bike. So <laughs> they should probably design around having a bottle. So if you're buying a bike that's been designed in probably the last two, three, four, five years, you're probably actually going to be faster with a bottle than without a bottle. Probably, not definitely. It's obviously, again, one year to have to test. Um, but yeah, if you go for some of the older bikes where they were designing with airfoil sections in isolation, so sort of like, for example, the two or three old generations of LOS5, where it was looked, looked great in isolation, but suddenly you put some bottles on it and they can be a whole amount, a huge amount worse. Whether it's faster on the down tube or the seat tube, depends quite a bit on rider leg interaction, at least from my testing. So again, one to test, unfortunately. And I think this is why so many people have found different results. Bottles are a fun area though, because the UCI have a bit of freedom in how you can use them, whereas in most of the rules, they're a bit tight. Yeah, I mean, should most people be the sort of aero bottles? I mean, people always like, we occasionally get bikes submitted for the bike vault and stuff where someone's put like aero bottles on and obviously there's a practical consideration that an aero bottle is less practical than a round bottle they on the whole probably are, yeah they're going to be faster than than a round bottle they're, they're aero profile they're a narrower profile with a longer section and they typically marry up a lot better with with frame designs or at least modern generation frame designs so if you take a, a standard round bottle what's the diameter something like 70 80 mil whereas your down tube is definitely not going to be 70 or 80 mil wide so it's not going to be quite so cleanly blended into the structure, shall we say, whereas uh, an aero bottle, definitely better in that sense. However, they're, they're pretty unpractical. I think anybody who's ridden with one will find out that's the case. So the cage doesn't go around the bottle, they tend to rattle, jump out. They're hard to put in because you can only put them in in one orientation. You can't just throw them in a round cage. So they're not so fun to ride with, shall we say. And you see so few people in road races using them, very, very few and far between because at the end of the day, you're, you're stuck as well. You've got to be fed by somebody who's got a load of aero bottles. So you have, um, like you spoke about briefly then, talking about the interactions of the rider's legs and then that sort of having a huge bearing on whether or not a bottle in a particular place is faster in a particular place system mm-hmm. basically but it's system dependent but something that we often hear from people discussing aerodynamics on bikes or criticizing it is that a lot of stuff in that area doesn't matter and a lot of stuff happening around the drivetrain and around the rear of the bike doesn't matter because that's all dirty air what's your take on that uh, they're wrong it does matter there is drag there quite a bit of drag actually the seat post and seat tube are, are pretty significant it was one of the reasons why with uh, the new Pinarello bleed 3d fhr i think is the official term there's a lot of uh, codes on the end but we we spent a lot of time looking at the seat post and seat tube and that's where i ended up with the tubercles you've got a lot of turbulent flow around there but a lot of flip-flopping onset flow angle because of your legs your your angle affected your angle at the seat tube seat post um goes plus or minus say 20 30 40 degrees depending on your leg geometry so there's a lot of interesting things going on there so the more you can deal with that changing onset flow the lower your drag is going to be and most of your drag comes from behind your legs and from behind your back so 
all the influence around there and trying to clean it up, deal with it, align with it is, is definitely going to reap benefit. Right. That's um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I wanted to ask if is there um, any sort of like big aero mistakes that you see people making or things that are just like you, when you see a rider doing this, you're like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, there's a few different ones. So I think one of the old school thoughts with it, at least it's still persisted within the Pro Tour Peloton for some while, was lower is faster and you've got to be on the drops when you're on the front. On the drops is actually nowhere near as quick as being on the hoods with a bent forearm. So like we were discussing earlier, your leg and it being a, a terrible safe in a cylinder, well, so is your forearm. And if you're on the drops, your forearm's pretty much vertical. So you've actually got a lot of drag there. Whereas if you end up with the same back and upper arm position, but literally have your forearm horizontal and on the hoods, then you end up being a lot, lot faster aerodynamically. What's your opinion on bar bags? They have a purpose and use them only for that purpose. I think if you're, you're out touring, enjoying the, the adventuring side of cycling, then fair enough. But yeah, aerodynamically, they're not going to be too, too great. I see a lot of people with like fancy aero cockpits and, you know, like nice aero bars on the front of their bike and then the, the bar bag becomes a permanent fixture uh, it's, a, it's an accessible location i can appreciate why they're popular but aerodynamically it's it's not going to be a fast thing yeah i've got some questions about tires the first thing i want to ask is we get a lot of questions about tire width what is the best tire width what should people be using what's your take on that tires are i guess the next frontier aerodynamics have start have been pretty well discussed i'd say for the past five years or so people talk about aerodynamics pretty pretty commonly, whereas tyres less so, they're, they're not so well understood. And that's not just in cycling, that's in, in motorsport and automotive. The world of tyre modelling is, is quite a complex one. And um, we struggle with it in cycling now, trying to truly understand what happens with a tyre. How does it deal with, with braking forces, acceleration forces, lateral forces as well. So it has things, you have slip angles and camber thrust. And then obviously you're, you're trying to optimise tyre pressure for rolling resistance and you go softer and you reduce your damping losses but you increase your steric losses and there's all this this massive complexity of optimization i think on the whole most people can run quite large and on the rear and are probably going still too large on the front so you can go bigger on the back because it's relatively unimportant whereas on the front it's very relatively very important you, you see clean flow and and how a, especially a deep section wheel sails is primarily dependent actually on your tire size but what size to go for is hugely dependent on the surface you're riding the wheel that you have what you're trying to race are you in mad crosswinds are you at super low your angles on the track or even some tts and going at 60k an hour and maybe only see two three four five degrees so yeah there's, there's all these different trade-offs to be made and there's no simple this is the way to go so for most people it's probably somewhere in the the nice big 23 to 30 mil range which is <laughs> <laughs> massive and honestly it's variable and i think i couldn't sit here and honestly say this is the right way to go it's a lot of it comes down to understanding all those different parameters and that's what we try and do within in the oscar and ideas we try and understand exactly how much raw resistance is impacted by changing tire size or tire pressure or different surfaces or different wheel depths so in terms of if the optimum tyre width to sort of not wreck the aerodynamics of your front wheel, but is yeah. there sort of that an interaction that they can look for in terms of how the tyre forms around the tyre that around the wheel mm -hmm. that like is kind of what to go for and what not to go for? So Josh Portner, who used to be Zip Wheels back in the day, now Silka, he, he famously came up with the rule of 105, which was back in the day of, of tubs when a wheel was the set size and a tyre was the set size. Unfortunately, that's different now with, with clinches and tubeless because if your internal rim, rim width changes, if you fit a 25 on, let's say, a 22 internal, it's not going to be 25 mil wide. It's going to be somewhere 27, even 28 mil wide. So it becomes a lot harder to make recommendations based on what's stamped on a sidewall and what your wheel size is. And even if it says 25 on a sidewall, if you get two 25 mil tires and lay them flat and measure them bead to bead, they'll be different. A good rule would say, at the very minimum, don't have your tire wider than your rim. That's absolute minimum. And then the rule of 105 still largely, I'd say, holds true. You want to be your tire to be at least 5% narrower than your wheel is at its widest point. That's it's a good rule of thumb. It's definitely not going to be the optimum for every single wheel and every single tire. Different tires have different aerodynamic profiles and uh, flow structures depending on what they are. They are vulcanized or an open tubular, as uh, the other styles typically called. So 105 is a good rule, but definitely don't go any wider than your rim is. Right. 
that's good advice. Uh, something else that, you know we've noticed, and there's been a big change, like in in pro racing, is is it feels like this year was the year finally that the pro peloton embraced um, clinches and tubeless over over tubulars. The majority of riders seem to be running that now. What is the difference, say, over the course of something like a Grand Tour, if a rider were to use a good clincher tubular setup versus um, the traditional tubulars? Honestly, it's, it's scary how big it is. The rolling resistance difference is like 20, 30%. And if rolling resistance is probably somewhere in the region of, let's say 20% of your total drag, maybe even more actually, some of these guys, 30, 40%, depending if they're hiding in the pelton all day, then suddenly you can have a huge difference. You could have a 10% drag reduction if it all came together in the right right way. But let's run with 10%. Let's say there's 10% total reduction in drag, then that's a huge amount of energy. 10% is a nice number, then you're bidding off, uh, let's say three days of riding over a Grand Tour. So two days of riding. Um, but if it was 5%, then suddenly you've saved an entire day over a Grand Tour. And I'm pretty sure any of those guys would quite like a day off if they could have it. That's pretty, pretty astounding when you sort of add up the amount of riding that they're doing. That's yeah, it's quite an interesting way to frame drag reduction. I don't think people often think of like, oh, 1%, that doesn't mean anything. But if you think, well, 1%, is, if you're doing a grand tour, you've got 21 days of racing. So one day of racing is 5%. So if you save 1%, then you've, you've saved 20% of an entire day of riding. So you just got off your bike with 40k left to go on that, that really grim stage because you made a 1% better decision. Mm. on your equipment choice. So it's um, it's a nice way of looking at the problem of drag reduction and how to sort sell those small percent points. Yeah, and you, you talk about like trying to sort of how to sell those those percent points. I mean, working basically as an engineer, try, I guess you have to do that. You have to work out ways to sell stuff to riders to make them think, oh yeah, I want to use this. Because we know what cyclists are like. They, they get ingrained in, well, this is what I've always used and they're scared to change. Yeah, I see that from everybody from club level like this to world tour level like this. I've always done it this way. And it's a really hard thing to change because I think psychologically you have to accept that you've done something wrong for some amount of time. And it's not that that's a bad thing. It just means at that point in time, you didn't have the information, the knowledge or the advice to make those right decisions. And I think some, some athletes are better, better than others at adopting change and dealing with change, whereas some really find it quite, quite a challenge and quite a struggle. Um, and they're, they're the ones that you've got to work with. They're the ones you've got to build the relationships with, explain the maths, the physics, everything that underpins it, take them on that journey, show them how you, how you do tire testing or take them to the wind tunnel and demonstrate the differences. Because when they're part of it, I think they, they really feel like they're valued and that, that those things are being explained to them rather than just like, here's a PowerPoint and why you need to change X, Y, and Z, go ahead and do it. It's, yeah, it, it, that makes sense, I guess. I mean, if it, has there sort of been... You know, any examples when you've, um, and you may or may not be able to answer this, but like where you've kind of been able to put something into practice and you've got a rider to change the equipment they've used and then they've been successful doing it by by doing a change and then they've gone like, oh, you were right. You were right, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, really good example. I can actually talk about this one. is Filippo's hour record. There were a lot of right. things that we were doing differently that he was a bit unsure of at first. And, and Filippo is de definitely questioning of, of things because he, he's been around the block enough times and he, he knows that like he needs to understand all these things to, to implement them. So everything from running clincher tyres on the track, for him as, a, as an Italian who'd run Vittoria tubs at 220 PSI forever, it was quite a change. But again, explaining the physics that underpinned it, the testing we'd done and, and why we thought it was a faster option and then he bought into it. It was the same with his gearing choice, bringing his cadence down significantly from his practice runs. He was 105 RPM and we got him down to, I think it was 96 in the end. There were a lot of other things to us within the Our Record Project, warm strategy, the pacing strategy, just he'd done things a certain way and it was just explaining the maths and the physics and the testing we'd done to, to justify why it should be changed and why it should be done a different way. And yeah, then he, he bought into things and obviously he went pretty far in that hour. So he's, he's sold now. He's he's gonna he's he's there. He's on he's on board with like all the all the tech yeah. and stuff. There's a few more things. We'll get him there. There's a few more details. Yeah. He just takes a bit more time, which is a scary thought that there's potential to go a good amount further. Well, I, well, I noticed he, he was he was using Shimano pedals. He wasn't using the the speed plates on his bike. 
Um, yeah, it's more. I mean, uh, Ineos Grandia is uh, sponsored by Shimano, and to be honest, he was he's quite happy. And pedals are another interesting one. They're they're quite unique to riders. So we we found the same testing on the track with a lot of different riders uh, through Watch Shop that sometimes speed plays aren't the fastest option. It's not a case of it is definitely quicker. You you've just got to test it. But yeah, things like the narrow Q factor, he ran slightly wider Q factor than probably we we would have hoped or, or aimed towards. Um, but yeah, small little details like that. I was keen for him to have a white skin suit, not a black skin suit, because you get quite really? a full load. Really? Cooling. <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't know if people quite appreciate how intense the lights are for broadcast lighting. It's, it's quite a high solar load. It's like the equivalent of a very, very sunny, very hot day. And I think people can appreciate how warm you can get just standing in the sun. Or if you can have a white skin suit rather than the black, the actual amount of energy you absorb not negligible on performance i'm not going to find 200 meters but it wasn't single digits yeah. as if it won that yeah i mean i know you've looked into sort of cooling and cycling performance quite a bit but i'm intrigued because you just mentioned it it's piqued my interest because i know that when you were doing practice hour records you had sensors attached on and and all the rest of it and I, it really is something that most people it's not on their radar like most people and don't think about the cooling aspect and the impact on performance at all but how important is it i think the reason people don't appreciate it is because you don't measure it at least historically we haven't measured it and people improve what they measure and if you can measure power then your power improves if you can measure your weight on a set of scales you'll improve it if you can't measure how hot you're getting then people aren't going to do implement in, interventions to improve that but it, it was super significant and, and this actually came down to kind of a combination of things fell in play to, into place to make us realize that. So I did a practice run on Manchester where I quite literally blew up, <laughs> got too hot. We had core temp sensor on and a core temp pill and skin temp and a few other sensors around that that made us realize, okay, there's probably something in the thermal physiology here because we hit about 40 degrees core temp, which is pretty hot. And then after then, it's a slippery slope downhill. And just soon after that, I joined INEOS. They have a partner with core or Greentag, who are a Swiss company who have designed, developed and, and sell the, the course temp center. Uh, and they have a lot of very intelligent people and they came along to one of our practice hours and started to look at a lot of the interventions that we could do to one, get myself cool in advance. So core temp as low as you can, but then also keep myself cool throughout the hour. And effectively it's measuring it and the impact was, was big. So my core temp would go up from say, resting is 37, 37 and a half, and I would be over 40 by the end and every degree Celsius, you increase your growth efficiency go down goes down by one percent. And when your growth efficiency is twenty and it goes to nineteen and then eighteen and seventeen, then suddenly you're costing yourself tens of watts. So the more you can keep your core temp down, the higher your growth efficiency is, the more power you can produce, which is a big old factor. And once you figure that one out, it's kind of everything else falls into line of making sure that yeah, you keep yourself as cool as you can. You're in an air conditioned room. You minimize your warm up length ice slurries nailing those and then also perceptive cooling as well menthol sis menthol gels um it's a small difference but you respond to what you perceive is happening what's actually not what's actually happening so making sure yourself feel as cool as possible is, is pretty important the, the straightforward answer is always wear an aero helmet but then you go well yeah if you're on a hot day and it's a hot climb it may, based on what you're saying you want there's an mm. argument for having the, the real vented thing that's less aero but <laughs> If you're going to lose that much on the hot climbs going so slow, like... Yeah, yeah. It, it makes a difference. And it, your head's probably the worst place to get hot because that's where you really respond to it. So if you have hot feet or hot hands, so what? But if your head gets hot, then suddenly everything starts going on red alert and your body's like, no, 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 time to shut down. This is getting dangerous. So if you can keep your head cool, even if everything else is, is cooking, you'll probably be able to put yourself... Well, death is the right term, but put yourself into a deeper box. Which is still um, something you've got to be a bit careful of because you can go over the, over the over the edge. Thanks so much for for taking your time to to chat to us, Dan. Some yeah, fascinating insights and stuff. Um, it's been great. But uh, I'll let you get off. W what are you doing in Andorra right now? <laughs> uh, bit of training, bit of work. There's a lot of uh, prep ahead of our winter training camps within Yasso. I head there in just over a week's time and uh, get busy, getting the guys fast, rolling them in some glitter, polishing them up a bit. All the best with that. I'll catch awesome. you later. Cheers.